Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 144. Today's big Bible question. Does the Bible teach that the return of Jesus would be soon after his ascension or much, much later? We're also going to be talking about some sea dragons in Leviathan today, so buckle your seatbelts. Hello, friends. Happy Thursday to you. Another day in quarantine, another dollar, I guess. One interesting thing for us today is that our family went to Carmel Beach in California, had a good time, even though it was kind of chilly. Uh, My son and I did some metal detecting and actually found a Morgan dime, uh, which those were only made between 1916 and 1945. So finding something like that in the sands of Carmel Beach uh, at about 12 or 13 inches deep is really pretty cool because you got to imagine that thing had been there on the edge of the ocean for decades, which is pretty cool. But today's episode is another Second Coming End Times episode because our focus passage in Second Peter chapter 3 is on the return of Jesus. Before we get to that, however, I should mention Psalm 74. Now, this podcast, the Bible Reading Podcast, initially started out as the Bible Mystery Podcast. And in that first iteration, which hit back in 2019, we talked about lots of mysterious things from the Bible, uh, such as the Nephilim, which I know my wife loves when I mention. Shout out to you, Janet. Uh, We talked about aliens. Is that possible from a biblical perspective? And we talked about Leviathan and sea monsters. And so we're going to talk about that very briefly today, because Psalm 74, 13 through 14 says, You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. So, does the Bible teach that there are sea monsters? And the interesting answer is, of course, it depends on what you mean by sea monsters. Now, in a modern and scientific age, we know that the ocean is full of large and fascinating sea creatures like blue whales, which can be a 100 feet long, giant oarfish, which are crazy looking things that can be up to 36 feet long, common sunfish, which are even crazier looking things, which can be over a ton in weight, various sharks, colossal squid, and possibly other strange and extremely large creatures that could be characterized as a monster in some ways. The Hebrew word used in verse 13 of Psalm 74 is tanyin, and it has a wide semantic range in the Hebrew Bible. And that means that this one word can refer to several different creatures, including the serpent that Aaron's rod became when he cast it down in front of Pharaoh. Perhaps uh, Ezekiel 29 verse 3 does give us a pretty good clue as to at least one of the identities of this creature. Ezekiel 29 3 says, Speak to him and say, This is what the Lord God says, Look, I am against you, Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great monster lying in the middle of his Nile, who says, My Nile is my own. I made it for myself. So, could a Nile crocodile be at least one of the translations for Tanin, which is the word that is translated as great monster in Ezekiel 29.3? I certainly think it's possible. Those Tanin are very, very, uh, those Nile crocodiles, I should say, are very, very long, close to 20 feet Uh, Very terrifying, and if somebody who didn't know the proper scientific name called them a monster, well, I think you could understand that. So that fits the context of the Psalms passage pretty well. Now, the second word used, uh, translated as Leviathan here, is a bit more interesting and tricky because it actually appears all throughout the Bible. The Hebrew word is Leviathan, which sounds very similar. You see where we get the name. And we discussed that word in depth on episode 42 of the Bible Reading Podcast, 102 days ago, roughly. And this was our conclusion then. The root of the Hebrew word, leviathon, comes from a word meaning wreathed or joined together and can perhaps give the impression of a long creature, possibly with segments or ridges. Some speculate that the Leviathan was a sea dragon or perhaps a now extinct species of a water-like dinosaur, or perhaps an extinct or undiscovered sea monster of some sort. Apparently, its mouth is very dangerous and its skin is very hard. Given the description in Isaiah 27.1 of a twisting serpent, I think a saltwater crocodile is a good possibility. 
These creatures can reach astounding lengths and sizes even today and could possibly have been larger in antiquity. Salties today, which are mainly found in Australia, can grow up to 20 feet long and weigh over 2,300 pounds. Nile crocodiles, which are found in the area in question, used to kill up to a thousand people per year and still kill hundreds of people per year in some places, so they match the ferocity that is attributed to Leviathan in the passage. Possibly the Leviathan was a now extinct forebear of modern Nile and saltwater crocodiles, or perhaps it was now a now extinct creature that is not really included in the fossil record as of yet. Perhaps as well it was some sort of large and fierce shark, another modern animal that m- could fit most of the biblical description of Le- the, the Leviathan. I wish I could give a more definitive answer, but I'm pretty strong team hippo on the behemoth, but way more open on Leviathan. So that's uh, just an overview of what we talked about way back on episode uh, 42 uh, from Job about what the Leviathan and the behemoth was, and Tanyin, I think, can also be a type of crocodile. So it's very possible that these are two words referring to the same or similar creature. The fact of the matter is we don't know. I think it's unfair to uh, say that the Bible is engaging in fairy tales or whatever here, because some of the creatures of the sea are very monstrous-like. Uh, various sharks are various are very monstrous, like a goblin shark, for instance. Look that up. And oarfish is a terrifying looking thing. So to call something a monster uh, that we now call by a different name is uh, I have no biblical problem with that. So what whatsoever. But of more spiritual interest to us today is our Second Peter three passage. So let's go read it and then come back and talk about what it teaches about the day of the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder so that you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last day scoffing and following their own evil desire, saying, Where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They deliberately overlooked this. By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world at that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed." Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promises, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight. At peace. Also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters. There are some things hard to understand in them. The untaught and unstable will twist them to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard, so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people, and follow from your own stable position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. So, over the years, the centuries really, since the Bible has been written, many skeptics have criticized the Bible in the past for the length of time that it has taken Jesus to return. They argue that Jesus and the apostles seem to expect the second coming at any moment. And indeed, there is some truth to that in one sense. It is quite clear that Jesus expected his followers to live 
in the expectation that his return could be imminent, happening at any time. However, does the Bible seem to indicate that the return of Jesus would be near or far from the perspective of the early church? And the answer is that it does not indicate this at all. Jesus and the apostles were quite clear that humans would not know the day or the hour, and that Jesus himself, he confessed he did not know the date or the hour. Only the Father knew at that time. So looking for hints of the timing of the end times and the second coming in Scripture is fruitless because it's not there, because the writers of Scripture and Jesus himself did not know. But when we read Second Peter chapter 3, we see all sorts of hints all throughout that passage that it could be a very long time. In fact, Peter, who is now at the end of his life, at the beginning of the book, he said Jesus has already revealed to him that he will be dying soon. So this is a much older Peter. Perhaps he's been waiting his whole life for the return of Jesus. And so he addresses the scoffers, the skeptics who are saying, where is this coming that he promised? And Peter says they overlooked this by the word of God that the heavens came into existence. And they overlook that with one day, the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And so it seems that Peter is giving us a good defense of the fact that the return of Jesus might take a very, very long time. Now, does he know how long it's going to be? Of course he doesn't. But it seems like he understands it may be a while. So let's turn to our old friend, theologian Wayne Grudem, who discussed this very issue in his Systematic Theology book, which is my favorite of all the systematic theologies that have ever been published, and I would encourage you to get it. And uh, I do understand Dr. Grudem is working on a new version. I can't wait for it to be out. I don't think it's out yet, but I am watching like a hawk for it. Here's what Dr. Grudem says. Were Jesus, were Jesus and the New Testament authors wrong in their expectation that he would return soon? Did they not think and even teach that the second coming of Christ would be in just a few years? In fact, a very prominent view among liberal New Testament scholars has been that Jesus mistakenly taught that he would return soon. But none of the texts quoted uh, require this interpretation. The Bible texts about the last days that say to be ready do not say how long we will have to wait, nor do the texts that say that Jesus is coming at a time we do not expect. As for the texts that say Jesus is coming soon, we must realize that biblical prophets often speak in terms of a prophetic foreshortening, which sees future events but does not see the intervening time before those events occur. George Eldon Ladd says, The prophets were little interested in chronology, and the future was always viewed as imminent. The Old Testament prophets blended the near and the distant perspective so as to form a single canvas. Biblical prophecy is not primarily three-dimensional, but two. It has height and breadth, but is little concerned about depth, i.e. the chronology of future events. The distant is viewed through the transparency of the immediate. It is true the early church lived in expectancy of the return of the Lord, and it is the nature of biblical prophecy to make it possible for every generation to live in expectancy of the end, because that is what Jesus commanded us. He commanded us to be ready and watching so that as soon as he knocks at the door, we open it because we're ready. We're expecting an imminent return. Back to Grudem. Grudem says, Peter also reminds us that the Lord has a different perspective on time than we do, so that soon with him may not be what we expect. He says, do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness. In other words, from the perspective of the Lord, which is the perspective that counts, he's not being slow, he's being patient so that many will be one to salvation. Many who are destined, sovereignly elected to salvation will be one to salvation. And when God has ordained that the days would come to an end, his son Jesus will come back. And I think First Peter, I mean, Second Peter chapter 3, is a very strong answer to any skeptic that says that Jesus in the Bible expect the second coming to happen very soon. Second Peter 3 doesn't tell us when, but is quite clear that it might be quite a long time, which is exactly the situation that we're facing. 
So let's go and continue reading in the scripture. Numbers chapter 30, verse 1. Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, This is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. When a young woman, still living in her father's household, makes a vow to the Lord or obligates herself by a pledge, and her father hears about her vow or pledge but says nothing to her, then all her vows and every pledge by which she obligated herself will stand. But if her father forbids her when he hears about it, none of her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. The Lord will release her because her father has forbidden her. If she marries after she makes a vow or after her lips utter a rash promise by which she obligates herself and her husband hears about it but says nothing to her, then her vows or the pledges by which she obligates herself will stand. But if her husband forbids her when he hears about it, he nullifies the vow that obligates her or the rash promise by which she obligates herself, and the Lord will release her. Any vow or obligation taken by a widow or divorced woman will be binding on her. If a woman living with her husband makes a vow or obligates herself by a pledge under oath, and her husband hears about it but says nothing to her and does not forbid her, then all her vows or the pledges by which she obligated herself will stand. But if her husband nullifies them when he hears about them, then none of the vows or pledges that came from her lips will stand. Her husband has nullified them, and the Lord will release her. Her husband may conform or nullify any vow she makes or any sworn pledge to deny herself. But if her husband says nothing to her about it from day to day, then he confirms all her vows or the pledges binding on her. He confirms them by saying nothing to her when he hears about them. If, however, he nullifies them some time after he hears about them, then he must bear the consequences of her wrongdoing. These are the regulations the Lord gave Moses concerning relationships between a man and his wife and between a father and his young daughter still living at home. Psalm chapter 74, verse 1. A maskeel of Asaph. Why have you rejected us forever, God? Why does your anger burn against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you purchased long ago and redeemed as the tribe of your own possession. Remember Mount Zion, where you dwell. Make your way to the perpetual ruins, to all that the enemy has destroyed in the sanctuary. Your adversaries roared in the meeting place where you met with us. They set up their emblems as signs. It was like men in a thicket of trees wielding axes, then smashing all the carvings with hatchets and picks. They set your sanctuary on fire. They utterly desecrated the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, let's oppress them relentlessly. They burned every place throughout the land where God met with us. There are no signs for us to see. There is no longer a prophet, and none of us knows how long this will last. God, how long will the enemy mock? Will the foe insult your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand? Stretch out your right hand and destroy them. God, my king, is from ancient times, performing saving acts on the earth. You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. You opened up springs and streams. You dried up ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours, also the night. You established the moon and the sun. You set all the boundaries of the earth. You made summer and winter. Remember this, the enemy has mocked the Lord, and a foolish people has insulted your name. Do not give to beasts the life of your dove. Do not forget the lives of your poor people forever. Consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of violence. Do not let the oppressed turn away in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Rise up, God, champion your cause. Remember the insults that fools brought against you all day long. Do not forget the clamor of your adversaries. The tumult of your opponents that goes up constantly. Isaiah 22 verse 1. A pronouncement concerning the valley of vision. What's the matter with you? Why have all of you gone up to the rooftops? The noisy city, the jubilant town is filled with celebration. Your dead did not die by the sword. They were not killed in battle. All your rulers have fled together, captured without a bow. All your fugitives were captured together. They fled far away. Therefore I said, Look away from me, let me weep bitterly. Do not try to comfort me about the destruction of my dear people. For the Lord God of armies had a day of tumult, trampling in confusion in the valley of vision, people shouting and crying to the mountains. Elam took up a quiver with chariots and horsemen, and Kir uncovered the shield. Your best valleys were full of chariots, and horsemen were positioned at the city gates. He removed the defenses of Judah. On that day... You looked to the weapons in the house of the forest. You saw that there were many breaches in the walls of the city of David. You collected water from the lower pool. 
You counted the houses of Jerusalem so that you could tear them down to fortify the wall. You made a reservoir between the walls for the water of the ancient pool, but you did not look to the one who made it or consider the one who created it long ago. On that day, the Lord God of armies called for weeping, for wailing, for shaven heads, and for the wearing of sackcloth. But look, joy and gladness, butchering of cattle, slaughtering of sheep and goats, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The Lord has directly revealed to me, This iniquity will not be wiped out for you people as long as you live. The Lord God of armies has spoken. The Lord God of armies said, Go to Shebna, that steward who is in charge of the palace, and say to him, What are you doing here? Who authorized you to carve out a tomb for yourself here, carving your tomb on the height and cutting a resting place for yourself out of rock? Look, you strong man, the Lord is about to shake you violently. He will take hold of you, wind you up into a ball, and sling you into a wide land. There you will die, and there your glorious chariots will be, a disgrace to the house of your Lord. I will remove you from your office. You will be ousted from your position. On that day, I will call for my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. I will hand your authority over to him, and he will be like a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one can close. What he closes, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a throne of honor for his father's family. They will hang on him all the glory of his father's family, the descendants and the offshoots, all the small vessels from bowls to every kind of jar. On that day, the declaration of the Lord of armies, the peg that was driven into a firm place will give way, be cut off and fall, and the load on it will be destroyed. Indeed, the Lord has spoken. Well, friends, I pray the Lord has spoken to you today through the word of God. May it edify you and build you up. May it point you to Jesus. May you be blessed and safe today. Good day and Godspeed.